Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. I am Oji Akbe. And I'm Biola Labi. Online retail chain Jumia has just been listed on the New York Stock Exchange, one of the biggest sports in the world. Following this, there is now heightened expectation that the tech industry in Nigeria and Africa as a whole will kick on from here and maximize as much as possible all the inherent benefits of this massive accomplishment. And to help us keep track of all that uh, here, we're being joined by Tukumba Ishmael, co-founder of Althea Capital, and Jay Alabrava, co-founder and director of business development at Paga Tech. Good morning and welcome to the show. Good Thank morning. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. As we, as we said in the, in the introduction, over the last week and a half, there's been huge excitement in the global industry around e-commerce, especially around the Amazon story, Amazon of Africa story, which is Jumia. I would like to get from you as someone that is also an investor and also invest, you know, just as an African, what does this mean in terms of the industry and the ecosystem? Well, the first thing is that the spotlight is on Africa. So, um, and it shows the potential of the African economy. It shows the potential of the consumers that we have here, over a billion. Um, we've been speaking mm -hmm. about the consumer-driven um, growth for many years and decades now, and this finally puts external validation on it. So, for e-commerce in general, the whole industry involves the um, consumers buying, but it also involves the infrastructure for logistics, mm -hmm. it involves the infrastructure mm -hmm. for payments. Mm -hmm. And so just if we're looking at e-commerce, it shows opportunity where we as investors can invest in those three areas. And we're seeing a lot of activity. It's not just starting with Jumia, it's been going on, but we're seeing now that for us, we're excited because it means that people now understand what we've been selling in, in terms of the opportunity for a while. Now, in terms of what it means for us here as Africans, we can't just, we, we can no longer just do business as usual. Mm. People are attracted to our shores, mm -hmm. they want to make investments, and we need to strengthen infrastructure. Mm. Um, for e-commerce to work, we need the financial infrastructure, which we've been working on, and I'm sure Jay will talk about that in a moment. We need energy for the businesses that are manufacturing the goods or uh, for, the, for the merchants that are listing on the types of Jumia and even selling directly. We need distribution infrastructure and logistics. So, and these are all areas where people can begin to grow businesses and scale. So, Let's not sit back and say mm -hmm. nothing's happening, mm -hmm. stuff is happening, and now the spotlight is on us, and we need to leverage that. And um, we need to strengthen infrastructure to make that happen. Mm. You know, we, the part, it, this is our party, we now need to dress up and be ready to party <laughs> and showcase what we have to offer. Fantastic. You're absolutely right. For example, like Jumia, I, I know one of the biggest things that they achieved was to include the logistic infrastructure with their delivery of, you know, their goods around and to make it more seamless. So in doing that, what sort of investment do you think that, you know, we should channel um, in our economy right now? For, for so so you, there are two things I want to take out of what you said because you raised an uh, important point. Um, they had to develop the in, um, mm -hmm. distribution mm -hmm. infrastructure. They didn't wait for all the ducks to be lined up. They realized that for them to be that e-commerce player, even though in other places you might be able to outsource that infrastructure, the logistics, they knew that they had to start that and strengthen it themselves. So in the first instance, as we look at investments, we recognize that sometimes some of the investments we're making, where they're breaking ground, they also have to backward integrate and mm -hmm. bring more to the table. They have to develop those businesses, deepen those networks. And then at some point, where, as the industries mature, you're able now to have that hived off. And that's how, in other places, you would have Amazon sometimes mm -hmm. using the UPS and the FedExes. Whereas here, what Jumia has had to do has been as um, they've had to be both the Amazon 
and the UPS. Mm. And so as it matures, those are business areas for others to begin to um, provide a service. That's providing the ecosystem. So for us as investors, we are looking at not just the front end, but you know what's happening along the value chain. Mm. What's happening? We want to see. E we need ecosystems, even for agribusiness. It's not just about the farmer. It's about the ecosystem of processing the um, produce that comes. It's about the logistics that gets that produce to the retail. It's about the packaging, the the processing and packaging, and then also the marketing that gets the products out there. So as investors, we're looking. If we're looking at agribusiness, we're not just looking at the farm end, we're looking at everything that happens till it gets to the fork mm. and how can we play in different aspects of that value chain. Jay, I want to bring you in here as an entrepreneur. What does this mean for other entrepreneurs, especially as you see this? Mm. And actually, how does this change your, what does this add to your arsenal when you're talking to investors? Certainly, great question. Um, we're very, very excited about the development around Jumia. Um, as an African business, and I know there's some controversy about that later. We're going to talk about that <laughs> soon. As an African business, um, it sort of puts a spotlight on the fact that it is possible to build great businesses that will be attractive to investors even outside, even outside Africa. Um, so for us, um, Paga, for example, is a startup built in Nigeria with a focus on you know, global ambitions. Um, it tells a great story. So investors can actually look at what we've done here and say, you know, this is a business that you can actually build, um, scale up, and actually use it as a template to do things in other places as well. So I think overall positive. Uh, we want more examples of this in Africa, and I think that should be the focus. Mm. Um, Tokumba, when, I mean, sort of the, the, the process to being listed, I mean, one of the conversations that was being had about Jumia was that Jumia would probably be priced at 13 to 15. Um, we've gone to see them gain, I mean, triple, a triple. <laughs> triple. Um, why do you think that international investors were so ready to jump on this, especially at a time where people have been saying that the, the middle class that we had been banking on, and it built so much, I mean, lions on the move, so many stories mm. are on the last 10 years, is almost mm. elusive, that it continues to, we continue to move the, the goalposts for the, that middle class continues to shift. Why was the world so ready to buy this story? And why was it so important that they did it now? So, you know, um, yes, we talk about the middle class and the, the commerce and the consumers that come out of that. And we've been talking about that and they haven't been ready. Why are they ready now? This has given them um, a vehicle where they can participate in the growth without actually having to have their boots on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So you can be in New York and invest mm -hmm. in Jumia mm -hmm. and um, participate in that growth. And the fact of the matter is, you know, by 2050, half of the um, world's population will be young people. Yeah. Significant percentage of that is going to be from the continent. Mm -hmm. So you can't ignore the continent. We're, we're known as the, the, the frontier, the last billion. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you want to have um, any uh, participation in the growth and globally, and you know that significant proportion of that is going to be from Africa, you want to participate. But you don't necessarily want to move to Africa, right? Mm -hmm. So, and if that's the case, you find structured investments that enable you to, to participate mm -hmm. um, without having to do the legwork yourselves. But really those investors uh, that recognize that they can have a larger slice of the pie mm. are the ones that actually do come and put their boots on the ground. Mm. So the fact is, having those formal vehicles to tap into that story is what has attracted um, the, the investors today. Um, you also are the chairperson of the African Private Equity Venture Capital Association. Mm -hmm. Was your phone ringing off the hook when this was <laughs> happening? What was, uh, what was happening? Well. well the, the fact is, you know, there's been a lot of buzz about around this. And we recently had um, our 16th annual com, um, conference mm -hmm. in Nairobi. And um, we had our largest contingent from the U.S. this year. And I would say that it's probably not unrelated to the mm -hmm. fact that they, are, they have been hearing more about the opportunity. And if you think about the trend as well, that 
many of our entrepreneurs, I mean, obviously with technology, you can be everywhere. So mm -hmm. they are also mm -hmm. going out mm -hmm. there and mm -hmm. showcasing mm -hmm. what they have to offer. Mm -hmm. Haga has investors from Silicon Valley. Yeah. So it's like the stars are aligned and people are like, okay, there's something happening. We can't, you, you know, you, we can't ignore this shine that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's coming. So um, there is more attention. There is more attention. Um, what we've seen, uh, at, what we saw at the conference was we had fund managers um, globally, but um, you know, a significant number in the room. And when we totted up what they had under management, it was over a trillion dollars. And so there was the power of that money in mm. the room mm -hmm. and the power to allocate a good proportion of that to Africa. But like I said, we need to come get to our house in order. Yeah. We need to come with um, the infrastructure, strengthened infrastructure. We need good management. We need good skills. And that goes all the way back to education. Mm -hmm. How do we prepare mm -hmm. people to mm -hmm. come into the workplace so that there is the talent? We can't grow without the talent. So mm -hmm. all the stars are aligning. And that's really what's bringing people to the table. Jay, um, there's been such a huge controversy about this being an African company, this not being an African company. As an entrepreneur, as a co-founder, who's building an African company? Do you think African faces are important when you're building an African company? And why is Jamia getting so much backlash when it comes to its Africanness? Yes. Um, <laughs> two, two, two questions. There. Um, I would say. I would say yes. I would say. First of all, I actually don't think the core question around, you know, is Jumia an African success story or not? Um, I don't think that's a relevant question. I think I'll go back to my earlier point that we should be focusing on how do we have more successes like this that actually showcase the abilities and the potential in Africa. Um, but I do think it is relevant to have African faces involved, um, not to step into defense of Jumia, but the original founding team, you know, involved two, two Africans that we know well, Tunde and Raphael. Mm -hmm. um, majority of their staff, I understand they have over three to 5,000 staff are, are Africans, you know, based in Africa. Yes, you know, they're incorporated in Germany. Development team is, I understand, in Portugal, et cetera, have offices in Dubai. But the majority of the market they serve is in Africa. Um, and they are solving a real problem. So I would say the label, you know, an African success story is definitely, is definitely there. Um, I actually missed the second question. No. <laughs> um, the second question was really more about as an, as an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. Um, as an entrepreneur, focused on Africa as well, um, I think the key focus for us has to be around making sure we tell this story clearly, mm. right? Mm. And this is an opportunity, something the Jumia team and the Rocket Internet team have done well. I mean, Tokumo mentioned Africa and how, you know, there's more visibility on great deals going on here. They've done a great job telling this story and propagating it and getting people's attention on it yeah. so that funds can come in yes. to support the business, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, we need to all do that a bit better as well because the potential is here and there are real problems to solve that require this investment as well. Mm. Yeah. Can I just come yeah, in um, mm. on, on that? Um, really the opportunity, who are the people that are buying on Jumia? The African African consumers. Yes. So yes. it's not just about you know, the people running the business. Let's go back, the consumer opportunity, the consumers are African. So that is showcasing that potential, that's one. Two, it didn't start here, but it has developed an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Tunde, mm -hmm. one of the co-founders, mm -hmm. we've invested in yep. Tunde's business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tunde has gone on to develop a business where they are funding the um, merchants and businesses, mm -hmm. many of whom listed on Jumia and who are also distributing their goods through other platforms. So this success is not just about the, the faces of the entrepreneurs, it's about the consumer story, it's about the ecosystem, it's about the entrepreneurs that have come out yes. of those businesses. Yeah. Yeah. And it's showing that those, on and those entrepreneurs have been skilled up now mm -hmm. and they're able to build great yeah. businesses. I mean, Lydia, as you know, funded, um, provided over $150 million in the past 12 months. Wow. wow. So it's almost like it's, it's, we're able to, vet to, because of some stories like this, there's almost like a two-sided economy that's developing. One actually is like putting people out into the entrepreneur 
ecosystem. The other is actually developing consumer products yes. based on experience. Because Jumia, exactly. because Jumia existed, there are other opportunities that have hap yeah. they're yes. happening. Well, I mean, the analogy is, you know, when Apple started s selling iPhones, yes. how many businesses have come out of being able to develop the app world, yes. Yes. the whole the app whole world, app yes. world yes. Yes. you know, so accessories. More, more obvious the, yes. the challenges that we face yeah. in building these businesses yeah. and to create opportunities. I like well. that you raised Apple as well, because there is a yearning need for digital innovation, especially out of Africa. So for my question to you, as an investor, what sort of opportunities can we jump on to actually um, help push this process along. So, <laughs> I'm giving away the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, like that. I mean, as an investor, you know, it's what's the uh, what's that analogy? The uh, the ice hockey analogy. You go, you look to where the puck is going mm, to go. Mm, mm. When we invested in Paga ten years ago. Haga did not have a license, mm. and people thought we were crazy. But, you know, I'd worked in Silicon Valley on a financial tech platform, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years prior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if we want the economy, the oil, the oil of, for me, financial services is the oil of mm -hmm. the economy today, right? That's what keeps things going. And if we want to be able to sell things, to provide goods and services, we need the financial service strata. And um, we saw that Paga, leveraging on the mobile technologies that were coming out, was going to be a good way to get that platform going. So we knew that we had to, to look at that. So answering your question in a roundabout way, you know, what are, for me, when I started Alathea 11 years ago, I was looking at the problems that exist around. Access to financial services was poor. Access to energy is still poor. Um, Agribusiness was not being developed. So how can we solve those problems, mm -hmm. leveraging on the consumer story to have growth? And so that's, those are the ingredients that I look at. You know, people, it's not about developing um, technologies that are looking for problems to solve. It's, looking, it's look, providing solutions to problems that exist. These are not nice to have. You know, we're not developing without, with all due respect to all technologies, we're not developing a technology for you to find out, you know, how to, you know. How to get, how to, how to, what to, how to eat today or something <laughs> like you, that. You which, know, like which counting your important. calories, counting your calories. <laughs> we, have, uh, we have more important or, things to or, do. Or, or, or looking at how to make your photos look better, yeah, which is sure. also something that people crave and, you know, can But once again, you know, they say first like, world problems, you yes, know, different world problems. Different yes. world problems. So we're looking at, you know, these are real problems. People, I remember the first time I used Paga to pay for a service from my sofa. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought it How was exciting. like, this is so exciting. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've been paying for stuff um, in other countries for decades yeah. doing that. Yeah. And at the time, it was like, this is a major breakthrough. I called people up. Do you know you can now do this? So <laughs> it's looking at what problems people are looking yeah. to solve. Yes. And then once you invest in those areas, you know that it's going to be the take up and the opportunity to scale then becomes more real because these are things that, these are, there's latent demand for mm. such goods and services. My question, my next question is to both of you actually, um, as an entrepreneur, as an, um, as an investor, as we look at this Jumia opportunity. Do we see opportunities for raising money on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, on the JSE, on the London Stock Exchange? I mean, or is it now all roads lead to New York? What does this mean as, uh, as entrepreneurs start to think of the different options? And of course, there's still acquisitions. I like to just, how, how are we thinking of raising exits now that this has happened? Yeah. So the Jumia story has, you know, sort of opened people's eyes even wider to the possibilities, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is a certain cachet to, you know, listing on New York. So, you, stock so that means you've called Goldman. Um, well, you know, <laughs> have they split feet as well? But the Nigerian Stock Exchange is a great opportunity yeah. as well, especially as we build um, businesses in Africa that have ambitions even abroad. It is useful and relevant to also allow for, you know, local people mm -hmm. to to able to invest. Mm -hmm. So. 
you know, um, we are maybe at least a few years away from, from this, but listing on the Nigerian Stock Exchange is a possibility, maybe a joint listing, et cetera. Um, because again, it's about just, you know, making the product and the service available to people, but also allow for local investment as well, so that the benefits accrue to more people. I mean, we certainly need to deepen our own capital markets. Um, we do have foreign capital that comes into um, our capital market, mm -hmm. but it comes into the bigs, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the financial services, the banks, the construction. Mm -hmm. It's like the FPI investment. Exactly. There's a, and, and as soon as there's a problem, there's a flight. Mm -hmm. So we do need to deepen um, and offering more opportunities for listing and for, um, you know, democratizing really the participation in the market is what's going to help us deepen those markets, attract others from abroad, but also provide a home for our monies. Um, the pension funds need more securities mm -hmm. to invest in, mm -hmm. so yeah. we do need um, that to happen. Now, for us to, as investors, when we look at exit alternatives, to be honest, most times we're not even thinking of a, a local listing. What um, about the GSE? Well, I'll, I'll come on to that okay. in a moment. We're thinking more, we're not even thinking about listing, we're thinking more, is there a strategic cap that sure. can buy? Sure. Is there another investor that sure. wants to come in? We look at those before we then go down to like, okay, could there even be an IPO? And mm. um, it's not being top of the list, but what this Jumia listing has shown is that there is a possibility mm. for that, mm. and it can be done. And I, I suspect it will result in more people thinking more about our African exchanges. The um, Johannesburg Stock Exchange, interestingly, um, over a decade ago, I was involved in the listing of a company on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange from Nigeria, dual listing. And back then it was seen as like, whoa, mm -hmm. this big innovative mm -hmm. thing. And then we saw a, a flux of companies trying to go um, that way. Now, that is also a possibility, but the companies themselves need to be strengthened to be able to be attractive. I mean, for Jumia to list on the stock exchange, we know that they're Governance yeah. has been strengthened. Mm -hmm. So having investors that can come in before the listing, that's mm -hmm. where we as private equity investors come in to help strengthen the governance, strengthen the business model, position the company so that they can be attractive for those companies that can only invest in public securities. That's a huge effort that needs to happen there. And we're already seeing in Nigeria a great growth of the private equity um, sector. There are more fund managers today than mm -hmm. there were um, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we see that ecosystem um, happening. And so I think over time we are going to see the possibility of more companies listing on our local exchanges here. It's still a journey. Okay, that's exciting to hear. There's hope. There's <laughs> hope. Um, I wanted to just have you talk a little bit about, especially since on the heels of your conference, what is the private equity um, deal flow looking like in Africa? In some reports, it looks like there's been a bit of a decrease, there's been a decline. Not that big of a decline, but a decline anyway. Um, I'd like to get your perspective, and what do you think is causing those declines? So, I, I want to correct that. It, it, it's not completely a decri decline, it's Decide. just slower growth. A slower growth, okay. It's slower growth. So, the growth um, this year um, in, in, in private equity, was uh, dollars coming in was probably um, around sort of like an extra three billion, but um, previous years it was like maybe 3.5. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a decelerated growth as opposed to um, a, a, a decrease mm -hmm. in the total pie. The, pie, the total pie is still, is still growing, but the, grow, the rate at which it grew is, is lower. So there's, there's still a lot of money coming into the market. We ourselves, we're closing two funds this year, one that's gender focused and one that's focused on access to essential services. So we're, we're adding to that pot in, you know, over mm -hmm. 100 million um, so, that we're adding. So, so there, there is more money coming in. Unfortunately, most of that money is still coming in from uh, just foreign investors. And we need to see more participation of our local um, pockets of money, the, the pension funds, mm -hmm. the insurance mm -hmm. companies, the local asset managers, because that when they um, get more involved, 
that gives more confidence mm -hmm. to the foreign investors sure. and therefore sure. you get more growth out of that. But all of that still goes to us being able to strengthen infrastructure, energy, um, the technology infrastructure, logistics, etc., that make it possible for the businesses to thrive and therefore make them attractive for the fund managers and therefore make the fund managers attractive for the <laughs> asset managers, <laughs> local and foreign. So, um, so it, the, the landscape is attractive mm. and there's still growth. In the later part of what Togumba said around um, there is growth, but still the majority of funds still come from outside. Yes. Um, I would say it's one of the greatest disappointments of building a business in, in Africa because most of your funding, especially if it's a, a large scalable business that will consume a lot of dollars, is going to come from outside. Um, but I would argue that the local pockets of money that you refer to should also be a bit more risk-taking, right? So if, with, if the infrastructure challenges did not prevent or prohibit foreign investors from investing here, then the, low, the African investors or the pockets of money should be even more eager to throw their cash Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Like the pension funds. Absolutely. Yeah. But, well, probably not directly into uh, yes. Jewish. Sure, like, sure. But sure, into, not, yes, into yes, intermediaries. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. And that's why I said them coming in increases the confidence yeah. for the foreign, foreign investors, investors to, 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 to um, uh, participate. And, and, and like you said, without that, I mean, you're in the environment you see what's going on and you should be able to see the opportunity. Mm -hmm. We need to open our eyes yes. as Africans yeah. and see the opportunity yeah. ourselves yeah. without just losing that to other people yeah. to see. And, but I bet you with um, this uh, Jumia listing, people's eyes have popped open just a little bit more and the skepticism has is, gone as, is reducing. Yes, reducing. For sure. Well, one of the things we know is that um, with the ease of business, there's visa on arrival, so who knows what's going to be well, happening finally. at the airport. Yes. yes. Um, OK. Go, no, go ahead. I wanted to touch more on the uh, women entrepreneur uh, funding Fund. that you were talking about. It's yes. quite interesting. And, I'd like yes. to and how can she get her application? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how did you know? <laughs> That's exactly So we're so excited yes. um, about this. Um, I have to sort of blow our trumpet a little bit yes. here to say this is the first uh, female-focused fund run by African female fund managers. Wow. Um, certainly in Nigeria, um, and um, the word is that possibly on the continent. So for us, this has implications across the value chain. It's showing um, my uh, colleagues in the fund management industry what can be done. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Male and female, like, look, this, this can happen. And then on the business side, it's immense because what it then means is that there's more money to fund um, female-led businesses, but also diverse teams. Now, I want to say that the reason we're doing this is not because it's a nice to have. Over 50% of um, businesses on the continent are owned by mm -hmm. women. That's correct. However, only 2% of those get funding. Mm. The manner in which um, these businesses get funded um, is different from the manner in which traditional businesses get funded because these women um, or diverse businesses are often operating in sectors that are overlooked. That includes fashion and beauty. You guys just had your own yeah, Arise yeah. Um, fashion, fashion um, day yesterday. Um, whether that's in education where you tend to have a concentration of female um, entrepreneurs and other goods and services, agribusiness, which is the largest um, employer as a sector in our economy, is predominantly um, full of uh, female entrepreneurs and um, small-scale holder farmers. So if only 2% is being invested in, we're overlooking too much of the population. We're not operating at full economic mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're doing our businesses a disservice because when you have diverse teams, you have strengthened corporate governance, better decision making. I just spoke about the fact that businesses that want to list in other jurisdictions, and indeed even in our jurisdiction, you need to have that strengthened corporate governance. Mm -hmm. You need diversity of perspectives for these companies to grow. 
you need diversity of um, producers for us to have innovation. You know, in companies, if everybody there is just of one gender, that's not going to work. And so for us, we're excited about this fund because what it means is that we are going to push on that diversity agenda for better innovation, better corporate governance, and therefore superior performance. So watch this space. If you are a female entrepreneur or a female co-founder, we want to hear from you. We are looking at a variety of businesses. We have, however, prioritized agribusiness, particularly around agro-processing. We've prioritized financial services. Mm. Um, we've prioritized tech enabling of traditional industries, which includes even the fashion and the beauty. Mm -hmm. And we are looking at fashionomics. It's a big area. Every it weekend is. we know yep. how many yep. women are being dolled up to go to mm -hmm. one yeah, event sure. or yeah. the yeah. other. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. even those that are not um, having to pay for that service, they want to look good. And um, it's a business that has export potential. That's important for us. It has regional growth, intra-Africa trade. So there's so many sectors that are being overlooked which can help solve the problem of our economic growth, which is in the doldrums at the moment, yeah. frankly. And I would posit that part of that is because we are not leveraging our full potential, having every member of the football team performing. Absolutely. Mm. You can't perform with half of your football team you on the bench. You can't perform with half of your football team on the bench. Jay we, want, yeah. Jay, we want to come to you because I want to um, really congratulate you and your team for, you know, once again. Um, Paga is 10 this year. Um, I can't believe it because I remember, <laughs> I remember, I remember um, being, I mean, it's, it's really exciting to be here to see this, especially being here at the beginning of those conversations. And really, I mean, we were, you know, those conversations started at a time where we all used to carry bags of money or people mm -hmm. used to deliver a bag of money to you. And really that, I mean, Pretty much that has been eliminated. I wanted to talk to you about really how you were able to get PAGA over the last 10 years to gain trust in a society with such low trust. How is that, what has that journey been like for you and the team? Yeah, it's been, it's really been an interesting journey. Um, and many of you know the PAGA founding story. Yeah. So my partner, Tayo, um, the way he tells it is it was built from his frustration having to carry cash around. Mm -hmm. You know, this story yes. about, you know, sending someone with a check to the yeah. bank, they come back with a bag of money. Um, but it's a problem that everybody faces. And when you think about the, I would say the elites, as we say in Nigeria, facing that problem, you can imagine what is happening at the lower rungs mm -hmm. of society, at lower income or in areas where banking penetration is very limited. So first of all, there was a real problem to solve. Mm -hmm. um, we attacked it in multiple ways. Um, one very visible way is through building an agent network, right? So agent network are, you think of it, mom and pop shops um, in every neighborhood around Nigeria. And these are places that are branded PAGA and people know they can go there to get their payments or financial services done. These agents are locals. They know the language. They know the problems people are facing there. Um, clearly, that person-to-person -person interaction sort of builds trust very, very easily. Um, but we backed it up with a very stable platform and a great customer service. Um, for us, it's the customer experience that sort of defines Paga. Mm. Um, a lot of the services we provide are also available on other platforms. Some, some are not. Um, we're available on other platforms. But the choice, we try to make it clear that the right choice is Paga because our service, if anything goes wrong or even when things go right, is a better experience on Paga. Um, it's been a very gradual process. Um, Ten years is not a short time at all. Yeah. Time, time has really flown. Sure. Um, but at the core of it is about just delivering that high quality service with, great, with a great customer experience. And tell us a little bit about, I mean, one of the things that we've been hearing about is sort of development teams all over, the, scattered all over the world. Tell us a little bit about your development team and how you guys have built mm -hmm. that capacity, that infrastructure that Tokumba so speaks about. Sure. Um, and again, this, you know, parallels one of the concerns around, you know, labeling Jumi as an African, African business. Um, in the case of Paga, our development team is what well, was primarily based in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. okay. And it was more coincidental. There's a partner organization that we work with there who's an investor in Paga, actually is very, very intri intricately tied to Paga. Um, and we've sort of built a development team around them in Addis. Um, but we now have a team being built in Nigeria, um, starting last year, 
we're sort of transitioning to having more people locally. But this situation where people have technology teams spread across different places is something you're going to see a lot more mm. of, right? Um, it is difficult to find specific talent. Um, let me speak specifically for Nigeria. It's very difficult to find a large pool of talented developers in one place. And frankly, you're competing here with not only the banks, the telecom companies, but now even with international players. Mm -hmm. A lot of the right. people that are trained and developed locally are actually either leaving or being outsourced. So it may be difficult in certain cases to compete on salaries, et cetera. Um, so a situation where you're tapping talent in different geographies and sort of figuring out a way to coordinate and work together, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And in this in increasingly globalized sort of market, um, I don't think it should be a cause for concern, right? Um, we want more examples of businesses that have been built, create opportunity for people to be trained, and then they can go off and sort of, you know, pay it forward in their own ways as well. Mm. I, I, as you sort of, as we look at building infrastructure, building the, the capacity of the people yeah. in Nigeria, Nigeria has one of, Nigeria, I mean, by 2050, we're going to be the large, um, third largest population. Most of those people are going to be young people. You're saying that there's not, a, there's not a big pool of developers in Nigeria. How do we, be, I mean, where do we start to build these skills? And we're not going to be able to build enough institutions for these people. So how do we start to build these skills that are really, that we need for the future? I mean, maybe a slight correction. I would say there probably is a large enough pool. We have a big population, so there's probably a lot of people that would put, raise their hand up that they can code. Right. Um, but again, it's about experience and actually in-depth knowledge of, of that. Um, we need to build that educational system. Absolutely. Um, truly, it has to start from the grassroots, right? Um, I don't have you know, the statistics or you know, what, what, what the right metrics there are, but we know that even from the kindergarten level, people need to start, you know, kids need to start being trained to think in a certain way so mm. that they develop properly in primary, secondary, and going to university. Um, and then you get to our university levels, there probably needs to be a lot more specific training around the areas that, you know, for potential growth. And one of them would be around technology, right? Yeah, and it's not just about programming, um, but there's things around like managing businesses and the softer skills around human resources, et cetera. Across the board, there's a real opportunity to sort of enhance our skill set and bring, produce more people that are, that, are, that are useful pretty much immediately. Um, we have a very young population, um, but Nigerians inherently are very entrepreneurial and very you know, ambitious. So there's a desire to develop these skills. Um, but fact of the matter is we're still competing with other countries and sure. other geographies trying to pull people as well. So what's That's next for Paga? There's a lot. I think. <laughs> ten, years, what do you expect? ten years is, uh, is, is just the first step. Um, so we have our, what we call our massive transformative purpose, which is to make it simple for one billion people to access and use money. And this wow. really, speaks to, um, really speaks to our desire to sort of solve this payments problem as well as the financial services problem. Um, but in there, you capture the point around one billion. There's, even if we're very ambitious, there's not one billion people in Nigeria. Mm. So there is a desire to sort of expand beyond the Nigerian shores. And we've been public about some of the companies. I read something about here. Latin America. It is potential because <laughs> remember that the, the problems that we're dealing with here around use of cash and access to, access to financial services exist in many emerging markets, mm. right? Mm. Latin America, Asia. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, even in Europe, you would find that there are countries where predominantly cash is still being used as well. Mm. So it's in, in a bunch of places. What we want to do and what we have built is a platform that is multi-currency um, and can work in pretty much any geography, right? Um, so we're, we're exploring. Um, there's, no, there's no steps yet to actually migrate or sort of build those teams yet, but this is something that we're exploring with our board, of whom Tokum is one, <laughs> and, board member. Um, and well, we're really excited about the opportunity there. And I the mean, we can see right. here, you guys go everywhere. Oh, I mean, you, you have that, everywhere. the agent networks everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. But that's an important point because as we were talking about, you know, getting the lo local funds um, available to invest in the fund managers, they, many of the um, investors are thinking, oh, in Nigeria, mm -hmm. is, it, is it big enough? Are they, can mm -hmm. you make yeah. those numbers? Mm -hmm. The fact is mm -hmm. we're looking at businesses mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. that are going beyond our shores. Mm -hmm. So the potential is hum huge. The potential in Nigeria is huge anyway, given our population, our population and the absolutely. consumer drive, but it's not just about Nigeria anymore. So people that are starting up businesses here need to be supported and encouraged to look at 
these big um, sites. I mean, one of the challenges we've seen with female entrepreneurs is not raising their aspirations mm. sufficiently mm. enough. Mm. And so being able to say, look, you can export um, African regional mm. trade, mm -hmm. you can take your mm. service, and with technology now, you can be everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, and if you go into um, retail outlets in the US or UK, you see our Ankara on sale for <laughs> multiples. You know, yes, multiples yes, of thousands yes. of I pounds mean, or dollars. Yes, Burberry had like 3,000 pounds exactly. for a dress. So, yes. Exactly, so coming back to the potential mm -hmm. of the female entrepreneurs and others in the fashion and beauty space, export potential from that mm -hmm. is significant. Mm -hmm. People are already willing. So if you can use technology to make our businesses more accessible and able to um, supply other mm -hmm. consumers mm -hmm. from other markets, that's when you begin to touch on this yeah. billion plus mm -hmm. that we're talking about even beyond the continent. Well, thank you both so much for coming on Easter Sunday. We wish you a happy Easter. And we, look forward, we look forward to having you back to talk more about this gender-based fund yes, once absolutely. you're ready to roll out and yes. once people can um, start to access it. And Jay, thank you so much. We thank wish you. you 10 more years. Can't wait to have and you more. Even more. And more. 10 more. And more. 10 more years and more. So can't wait to have you come back and tell us some of the big, big things that are happening at PAGA. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Speaking. Latin American. Yeah, yes, yes. He might be speaking Spanish by then. <laughs>